Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a new episode of Iblis Manifestations podcast. On today's episode, it is my absolute honor and privilege to have none other than Mr. Okoe Jones. He's the vocalist and guitarist of the renowned Swiss band Boltzer. They are arguably one of my personal favorite uh, contemporary and uh, modern bands uh, coming up at the moment uh, who have made a fair amount of noise in the last 10 years or so, I would say. And uh, it's really fascinating. And I think that, that they've truly evolved into something special. Uh, and I, I recently had the uh, opportunity to uh, see them live in London as a part of the Chariots of Fire tour. Uh, and it was truly magical. It was a great performance, and uh, I also had the privilege of uh, meeting up with Okoye himself, and honestly, I've got nothing but good things to say about the guy and his band. So, yeah, this turned out to be a great episode, and I really do hope that you guys will enjoy this one. I'll be looking forward to bringing it to you. Uh, before we continue with the episode, uh, I do have to put in a word uh, for a bit of shameless self-plug. Uh, this is going to be uh, about a song that my band Tribex recently released. Uh, it is titled The Serpent's Gaze. It is now available as a lyric video on YouTube, but it's also available uh, for free download on our Bandcamp page. Uh, this is going to be a part of an EP that we are releasing of the same title on the 31st of October this year, which is going to be released by the legendary label Cold Never Dies. Uh, so if you want, you can also place uh, orders for the pre-orders on the label's website, and I'll be sure to link up all of this on the Iblis Manifestations page. So yeah, any attention to that, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to cut straight to the chase. Uh, this has been an episode that I've been very much looking forward to bringing to you guys, and I hope that you will enjoy it. So now, without further ado, allow me to welcome Mr. Okoe Jones. From Bolzer to Iblis Manifestations. Right, Mr. Okoe Jones from Bolzer. Finally, man, I'm uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you for uh, making the time in the middle of the tour to uh, jump on a bliss, man. Uh, much appreciated. No problem. Thank you, man. Uh, sorry it didn't work out earlier, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, you know it, it's it's one of them things. I do, like I said, I appreciate you uh, juggling the time to uh, try and fit this in uh, in the middle of a tour of uh, such a magnitude. You know, so it's great. Are you just at the lounge area of the bus right now? I am actually. Yeah, I just um, asked the boys nicely if I could hike a hijack it for an hour, and um, right we just got, Yeah, we just got back from an off day, which was really pleasant. Um, uh, at the beach in northern Spain, so it was very cool. Um, Sounds but, fucking cool, man. How's the tour been so far? Great, yeah, yeah. I mean, like on a personal level, it's fantastic. We all get along very, very well, and musically, I think it's a very solid package as well. So you know, I mean, they were all deciding um, factors for actually joining at all, and um, yeah. So uh, I mean, yeah, as far as a tour package goes, I think this is like one of the best that's, I think, uh, hit Europe. I mean, if you're an uh, extreme metal fan, uh, mm. then it's, it's kind of like a no-brainer, really, I think, if you think about it. Yeah, the turnouts have been um, speaking volumes as well so far. So, um, yeah, let's just hope it continues on that on that uh, course. <laughs> Absolutely, man, yeah. Well, you can bet that the London one is going to be fucking crazy. Oh, so, yeah, looking uh, forward to that. Yeah, all of us gang will be there uh, right at the front. Uh, so uh, that's great, man. I know you toured with Watain before, uh, back in, was it Australia a few years ago or something? Yeah, that's right. That's the first um, uh, few shows we did with them. Yeah. yeah. Cool, man. Amazing. Well, uh, 
you know, uh, I think the last time that I actually saw you live was uh, when you were doing a tour with Toke and One Tail One Head back in uh, 2018. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe uh, this was around uh, September or October when you did uh, Manchester. And yeah, uh, yeah that, that was great because that was the first time I actually got to uh, hear the hero material live as well. And uh, cool. uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, which was which was cool, man. Obviously, um, it's sort of like I feel like the way the band has grown uh, had especially grown for like a few years around that time. You know, it seemed that there was like a real flourishing that was happening. Um, I mean, the first time that I saw you was with Destroyer 666. Uh, at Nambuka in London, I'm gonna say April 2016. You and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was a fucking that was a killer show as well. And that was obviously I'd heard of Bolzer uh, or Bolzer at that time before, and uh, and I, I saw you guys come on, and I think you had the Lemmy mustache, uh, the you had the mutton chops at the time, <laughs> you know. So I was like, okay, these these guys mean fucking business, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, you try new things sometimes. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, and I think that was just a few months after he passed away. So I was like, right on, mm. you know. But um, but it was cool, you know. It's it's great seeing how the band sort of uh, has flourished, uh, especially during that time, you know, of obviously taking from all uh, the EP releases that you did, and then the album, and then uh, obviously now. Uh, uh, this is one thing I I wanted to ask you about as well, actually. Um, I was surprised at how long it actually has been since your uh, last release as well. I thought I thought it was only like a, like a year ago or something, and uh, I was I, I sort of refreshed my memory on it, and it was like November 2019. How has it been so long since your last release? Well, I mean, obviously there was uh, some global issues that happened, and sort of might have been yes. Well. And we, um, yeah, that sort of uh, disrupted any kind of touring plans we had. So. Um, we would have toured that material uh, more extensively than we did. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to just focus on writing. Uh, did a few shows in between. Uh, and that's basically taken us to this point at the moment. Yeah, so it's, you know, um, we're, we're still stuck in writing mode, uh, planning to at least release something as soon as we can. would like to say next year, but um, we're also... Um, just uh, looking at potential um, label partnerships first. And uh, yeah, that, I guess that will be the decisive uh, you know, uh, point of release. So that's the most important thing on our, on our radar right now. And um, this tour, which had, you know, we'd been uh, informed about since last year. So that was planned. And yeah, we'll be doing some, some more touring next year as well. But yeah, that's really about it and obviously the private life factor with uh with the whole uh, crisis you know there were a few changes we took on board and i with my business and stuff as well it was um quite turbulent so for a while so that was just occupied us outside of the musical arena um yeah but we've definitely stayed very focused on what we'd like to do and uh um there'll be some good things happening in the, in the near future i'm sure you think it's uh, provided much of an opportunity, uh, creative-wise, to be able to sort of uh, delve a little bit deeper, you know? Because uh, you know what it's like when you're obviously playing shows and, you know, it's like your whole life is just sort of, uh, it's it's all kind of like one thing, you know, you're playing shows, then you're coming off home, and then it's like day in, day out, you know, that it's that kind of a life, which is great, you know, we all, we all fucking mm -hmm. love to... Uh, live that kind of thing but uh, did you see much of an opportunity creative wise in actually um seeing if there was any new areas you could perhaps uh, explore uh, in terms of songwriting and the direction of the band for the next yeah uh, absolutely i mean there's a lot of like uh, you know introspective um time being spent on uh, you know what had happened in my private life uh, yeah, relationships with other people and things like that. And that was, yeah, just everything in general. So I guess uh, for a, a lot of people, um, the aspects of uncertainty that arose, you know, like uh, uh, occupationally and, and mm -hmm. whatnot, and uh, lead you to question a lot of things and uh, put things into, yeah, just decide what you want to do <laughs> and how you want to do it. And I guess that... Um, it's a similar case for the for the creative process. Uh, definitely, uh, Bolzer is always 
been about challenging uh, ourselves or uh, our little perspective on on this type of music and um that will never change and it definitely uh it's no different for the for the new material um trying new things and just yeah so it's uh just a lot of experimentation and and spontaneity that gets thrown in there for good measure um sure but uh yeah I, I'm, I'm really happy we uh we're we're faced with this package as one of the first um ventures to to partake in after um the pandemic or whatever you want to call it um as you know it's 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 quite a uh, bombastic sort of affair you know i mean uh um, Watain uh, are good friends and they also have a very impressive uh, stage show and yeah it's nice to be faced with something like that again um, to also I guess inspire oneself for for a future um, in terms of what you can do live and we've also we've always been very uh, I guess very humble in that sense like regarding visuals and it's something we've wanted to venture into uh, more extensively um yeah which uh this kind of thing is is very good for yeah being around that people be... that are constantly looking outside of their you know or challenging their own their own uh boundaries all the time yeah, yeah i do definitely think that what um as far as the live show thing is concerned i mean even if you just want to take it purely for aesthetic reasons they do uh-huh. still as far as an independent extreme metal band is concerned, they do kind of set the bar, you know, that there's, yeah. there's not really a lot else. Like if you, you like you very often actually see other bands that have been around maybe even longer than they have taking influence from their stage show, which is mm. something that I've noticed a lot, uh, which is, which is fine. You know, that's, uh, I guess yeah, yeah. it's a part of the game really. But um, it, it's interesting that you would mention that uh, about uh, Bolzer as well, um, that uh, you would consider doing more of that. Because this was actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about as well. Because obviously everyone always talks about the whole uh, two-piece uh, aspect, uh, you know, which is very yeah. impressive. You know, you, you certainly stand out uh, in a way. I mean, there's only really um a few two-piece bands within black metal that really stand out or i should maybe even say metal as a whole which is obviously um i'm gonna say you guys are faust and probably inquisition and uh-huh. outside of this there's not really i know that the band that should not be named but <laughs> i know outside of this is not really like a lot um of other yeah. two-piece bands that do this but you still even within that subcategory keep things very much unique to your own style and sound and one of the things i wanted to talk to you about was how does it feel um because you're also taking on a lot of responsibility when it comes to the shows so you know that when you go on stage obviously uh you've got uh, fabian behind you as well but Mm -hmm. it's pretty much that you single-handedly almost uh well together you control the entire sound that the audience is hearing so any slide note that might be off or like even with the vocals i mean you, you don't help yourself man you know writing all all the parts and then you yeah, got yeah, the clean vocals on top of it it's very complex yeah. thing so what's it like handling the pressure of just uh having like uh basically like uh like a symphony of of your own going on stage pretty much uh it's always been there you know that that factor um uh so i guess it's part of like part of the um emotions that are present and part of the way um we write the songs they have an element of uh fragility to them as well you know like um although they're very much based upon this uh, explosive power um they are yeah they they can break <laughs> so it's 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 kind of um as you said it's kind of a a bit of a, a daring uh undertaking sometimes and it's juggling with lots of different feelings at the same time which which i think i learned to enjoy a lot but also you know can be uh can be yeah very challenging and frustrating as well but that's just part of one uh entire um process i think for me um, I, I can't really separate, you know, 
or I would rather say I would rather not name anything in particular to be negative during that process because it all belongs to yeah, one um, one all-consuming sort of uh, um, package. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing to do to describe. But as you can imagine, if something goes wrong with um, you know one of my line signals or yeah, I fuck up or Fabian fucks up, which happens uh, quite often. <laughs> um, so that, that yeah, it's just part of the whole thing. And over the time, you learn to you know, try and make it not happen or alleviate any technical possibilities of that happening, um, which is another enjoyable challenge as well. Or, you know, yeah, it's... Um, I, I feel like... That. Yeah. I feel like there's a beauty in that, though, because it's yeah, just course. so daring, isn't it? Mm. There you is know. a beauty, of course. And as I, as I mentioned, it's like, for me, it is um, uh, it definitely uh, shows its face in the lyrics and the general concept or the general atmosphere of things within the music. It's not very, you know, black and white, uh, bestial aggression or anything like that the whole time. I mean, there's quite a, quite a bit of dynamic going on. Um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that, that you know those those elements of uh, fragility once again are not necessarily only a negative thing. You know, uh, I actually think that's one of the biggest appeals about Bowser's music as well is that there's that uh, daringness when it comes to uh, just the usage of melodies or even like you said yourself uh, with the lyric writing. I know melody is like a is like mm -hmm. a scary word when it comes to this genre, but I feel like when it's used in such an honest and almost naked way. You know, I mean, you see this a lot. Uh, I think the song Archer is such a perfect example of that as far as the song itself and the lyrics and everything, uh, at least mm -hmm. for me personally, as an observer, you know, I, I think that there's almost something, uh, you know, because everyone within, uh, be it black metal or, or whatever, you know, there's this thing of everyone is like, oh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so hard or, or whatever. But then there's this uh, thing of like, well, if you're really that true, then express your real feelings. You know what I mean? Yeah, precisely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we never try to, um, uh, you know, hide behind any kind of other mask it's what you know we, we are what we are and um it's nice to also be accepted for many different uh avenues of extreme metal musicians uh within the genre who appreciate us for that mm -hmm. uh, because we appreciate them for the same you know and um uh yeah it's good to see that that people can understand that i mean obviously there are quite a few out there which are only about one thing and they're not willing to uh, accept anything else but uh, yeah uh, i don't have to necessarily go on tour with them <laughs> uh i can listen to their music for for what they do and i love it and um but it's nice to yeah constantly be accepted by uh i mean retains a good example as well they definitely yeah. have a different vision but we do meet on many different uh um crossroads as well um sound and concept wise maybe just presented in a different way um, and on a human level there's you know there's a lot a lot else going on which is which is nice uh yeah, i could definitely it. see that man yeah yeah i could i could definitely see that and i think you know like i said that's that's a part of what i like you know is that uh, art should be you know it should be honest uh, mm -hmm. And I feel like uh, that's something that I can recognize within Bolzer. And, uh, and I think that especially from, uh, I would probably say from hero onwards, I feel like a lot of people can begin to recognize that uh, a bit more. Because before that, there was still very much this sort of obscure ethereal element to it, uh, which uh, it was mo mostly perhaps um, um, a point of fascination. That brought mm -hmm. the enjoyment of the band, you know, like with the first uh, two EPs. But then I feel like from Hero, the, and obviously you've got the better production and, and, and all this other stuff as well. But there was that sort of like, it was easier to connect to it. It was easier to recognize the human, but then therefore through that, then recognize the beast in the music as well, I feel. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can understand that. I, I do very much um, still feel that both sort of a live band. Um, in that sense, because 
uh, if it's presented properly and the production is um, is willing, uh, then uh, that energy that's present live is what I like to feel the music is about as well, you know. Um, and I was never a, a really a big, uh, I don't know, a big fan of our recordings. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. It's oh. a process that is necessary. I enjoy certain elements of it, but I once something's recorded, I basically leave it behind me and look forward to what I'm doing next in terms of writing. And then I enjoy playing those songs in a live context. But um, I'm never really much been about, you know, um, hanging on to what has been recorded before. Um, I know this that is interesting that. to hear. So it's almost a case of you just want to release the songs just to introduce people to it, just so that they know what you're playing when you're playing well, live. I guess in a certain way, yeah, in a certain context. Um, I would like to think that um, I'd be much more happier with one of the coming albums recordings in a in terms of musical audio production. Um, perhaps uh, we might get to that point where we, where I can surprise myself and actually enjoy you know the entirety of the work a little more. But essentially, yes, I think um, uh, that format um, serves serves that purpose first and foremost to give the music a platform and then be able to play it in a live arena yeah that's very interesting man yeah i mean uh, you do obviously when it comes to the whole live thing as well you do definitely feel that that presence and that energy which uh, sort of comes through and this is actually one of the things i wanted to ask you about as well obviously the name uh Bultzer, i know that it stands for, uh, at least if if I recall correctly, to your own uh, description, it's a powerful strike of energy that has uh, zero regards for consequences, and it's basically just this powerful energetic force. Mm -hmm. And the thing I wanted to ask you about that is, obviously, uh, since having uh, the bands in your life, and especially since you've become active as a live band, and since you've had this tool of expression through Boltzer, how would you say that this music has actually uh, helped with your own personal development? Uh, and the reason why I ask this is because I look at art as a form of exercise, especially within the most more extreme realms, uh, which mm -hmm. we're talking about. And mm -hmm. I find that it's a case of, you know, getting shit out of your system, you know, whether it's like uh, going to the gym or like just that expression of like, just fucking, you know, getting shit out. So, but but I feel like when you get shit out, then that's not just the end of it. Then you end up with lessons and growth and uh, reflection. So that's the part that I'm wanting to see how you think Boltzer might have actually helped you grow as a person. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, that's everything what you just said, I mean, that's um, most definitely uh, uh, an important thing for me as well. Um, it goes, yeah, it's uh, very cathartic and it's be very painful and uh, as well as enjoyable as well i mean it, that, that, that's what it's all about it's um growth and discovery and self challenging as well as self awareness or yeah um as much as it is a very uh instinctive and necessary drive within um, myself and i'm sure most people who choose to do it on a regular basis you know playing live or recording music or um it's it's something you need to get out of your system or at least you need to feel within your system this this um sharing something that you've you know created or at least letting it out <laughs> uh, that's a good way of putting it, it. it, it yeah it's um yeah, i think it's very much a therapeutic um Process, yeah. So I I don't know how how to ex put it into words all the time, but um, it's definitely something I feel very passionately about. Yeah, and um, yeah, it goes hand in hand with with sport as well. It is a sport of its own. Um, 
uh, on a spiritual and, and emotional level. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I remember when I saw you in Manchester, you kind of had the lights uh, from behind you. So I could mainly just see your shadow, you know, and obviously if you've got that, then you can sort of, you can see the figure clearly. And I was like, holy shit, this guy does not skip leg days, you know? So it was like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, leg days. Uh, I like to run. Um, yeah. And, uh, some bit of calisthenics in there as well. And, but yeah, I was oh, that's tough. very passionate about running, but, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's it's great, man. I, I told you, like just before this interview, uh, I, I did say that the, I was just doing the chest and bicep session, uh, mm -hmm. listening to. I, I I like to do like a quick run of the the back catalog of whoever I'm I'm having a conversation with. You know, obviously this is material I've pretty much been listening since you've released them anyway. But uh, it mm -hmm. was kind of cool to revisit it, and it, it's it's such a it's such a great. Um, it goes so hand in hand in that kind of an environment. You know, it's that like you said yourself. You know, it might be painful uh in the temporary but then there is growth down the line which is essentially what even uh what yeah. just exercise or anything like that really is mm. uh, at the end of, the day. Mm. of course yeah and i guess pain uh it, it, it's not something to be viewed on its on its own there it belongs to once again the entirety and it doesn't yeah uh, and at the end of the day it's no longer pain it's just yeah, part of this this whole thing you know so um yeah that's a nice analogy for sure. Uh, one, one I can relate to certainly. Yeah. Sure. How would you uh, say that this, um, at least what you are doing now uh, is in any way a consequent of your, uh, perhaps your adolescence or even uh, childhood, would you say? Because obviously um, your own father was, uh, he's a musician as well. Right. Yeah. And even your yeah. grandfather. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering like, in what way do you think uh, now that obviously some time has passed and you may have had the chance to reflect, uh, how would that have influenced you um, on, uh, on on the path that you've uh, taken? I'm, I'm sure very much. I mean, um, yeah, my, my father is a musician and I grew up uh, around a lot of music on a yeah just a daily basis. And my mom is also very passionate about um, music and so it's yeah it's always been there and my sisters also enjoy music very much so it's um as much as it's something i kind of ended up having to do or having this innate drive to it um, you know you pick up a guitar and learn songs or uh need to get this something outside that you that you have within you and um then i guess the the whole philosophical or whatever uh, factor came into play where you you know music becomes a little bit more than just uh, an enjoyable uh audio session or something i mean it you know it, it has a lot more in it um and once you delve into that or certain musical genres are reliant upon that you know, the visual factor, the entire ideological content of the music, uh, the messages, and um, I guess that can have a profound effect on, you know, a 16, 17-year-old, um, particularly metal, um, or the extremer forms of metal. Um, I think, you know, that's what gets a lot of people uh, <laughs> into into that, that line of, of music. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think it was much different with myself. And yeah, I just found that my um, my interests in certain literary topics and um, and history and things like that they found a home within uh, you know the extremer types of metal as well, or not necessarily. I mean, even atmospheric forms of music and you know classical music or um, electronic music. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it all becomes uh, this one this one intense um, sort of emotional journey that you throw yourself into. Yeah. That's a, you know, that's completely relatable for me. I mean, just as a quick interjection there, I mean that to me, uh, it was exactly the same discovering mm -hmm. metal. Uh, and obviously for me, I, I discovered this over in Iran, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran, we're not even fun yeah. to listen to it, you know? <laughs> so it was that's like, it. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was I, I was around 14, 13, 14 years old and discovered Metallica by complete accident. And then that was just game over, you know, and it was wow. like it. But it was that thing that, you know, um, I was kind of always the outsider, too. You know, I wasn't exactly like a loser who didn't have friends. I was just different. You know what I mean? And discovering metal like did not help that whatsoever. You know, yeah. <laughs> if anything, it encouraged it even further. And yeah. uh, it's just that you find such a, you're right, it's not just music, you find a certain force and drive within this thing that mm. it's like, it's uh, just the fact that you even press play on like a cassette player or whatever, that alone is a statement, you know, yeah, it's, it's not just about what riffs or melodies are being played, it's the whole thing. And um, oh, yeah. I yeah. think it's well, uh, uh, aside from your, uh, you know, that must be, uh, I would like to hear more about that, um, how that happened and what it means, you know, to, to uh, be a part of or practice um, extreme forms of something that are not necessarily accepted in, you know, that societal context. I mean, it must take on um, far more, uh, yeah, intense meaning than someone who's allowed to <laughs> well i think uh, yeah thank you i think the thing that it meant for me was that it got to the point where uh, i mean this was the thing i was passionate about the most uh my passion of metal and extreme metal uh and what rock and roll stood for uh surpassed my likeness for anything else in life uh, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you can probably relate to as well, or at least to some extent, you know, like I'm sure we've all been through that, but mm -hmm. experiencing this kind of um, reaction uh, with the, the, this sort of emotional uh, so, sort of robustness towards the genre and, and what it stood for also meant that I then had to come to terms with the fact that what I liked the most uh, could get me killed or arrested uh, and then yeah. you know that kind of thing and, and this i had to go through this at a relatively early age but i think that ultimately uh what it did at least on a philosophical level i'm speaking i'm not i've not really disclosed much of the details yet but philosophically speaking it, it sort of allowed a sense of well fuck it you know if we're gonna get arrested if we're gonna die i mean there's a video of me on youtube from uh, b before i performed my very first underground show in Tehran. And this is kind of what I say. I'm saying, yeah, we might get arrested and fucked up. Who gives a shit? You know, let's fucking do it anyway. And that's kind of, uh, that's the attitude that I've maintained. And obviously, since being in the UK, I always try and remind myself of where that, that came from and, and try and keep right. that fire ignited. And not just even for metal, but even in the case of like how things have been in the last two years it's just like remember fuck it you know no one's gonna tell you right. how, how to do things and um, just always remember yeah, that. precise no that's a very uh, valuable uh, essential lesson then right there you know that a lot of people could could um perhaps put a little bit more a little bit more thought into you know remembering how important that actually is um I think that's that's beautiful, very uh, very fascinating. <laughs> I would I would like to experience that a bit of that fear, you know, within within our uh, our avenues of music here on on the continent, or at least in the Western context. I think that would be uh, it would do it a, a lot of good, you know. Your experience um, experiences with uh, ex the extremer uh, uh, line of music or thought or uh, ideology, philosophy, um, that fire, fire that, that you choose to keep ignited, uh, or at least the, the, acti the active uh, undertaking behind it as well, would do um, the Western uh, context of extreme music and culture uh, a world of good yeah um, I, as, i'm i hate to say it but in a way i, I do feel like I, I do actually agree with you on that you know and and this is the at the same time 
I don't ever wish anyone to have to go through that level of prejudice just because they want to play a certain music that they like. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. I, I don't mean yeah. the, um, the oppressive uh, uh, factor or, or, you know, <laughs> people necessarily being faced with violence or death because of that. I mean the acknowledgement that it is mm -hmm. something extreme you know um i think uh that fire is essentially what i was referring to and that you choose to keep that ignited you know i think uh, a lot more people could i don't know actively focus on that factor or at least know where it comes from it might be um quite apparent to many of the musicians um partaking in the music or themselves or writing and making it but I think uh, perhaps a lot of people that consume it or the way it's uh, presented um, it has become very safe in a certain way, you know. And I think that's a that's a bit of an ironic uh, kind of way to end. <laughs> well, I mean that's that's what happens when when uh, things you know uh, commercialized or become contemporary, uh, contemporarily re relevant for a lot of people. It's, yeah. Yeah, I. I understand what you are saying completely, and I Maybe think not. that. Sorry, I can get yeah. into. No, no, no. I <laughs> some of my thoughts a little sometimes, and it's just, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I know. I well, listen, man. I know exactly what you are saying. You know, I, it's, um, it's, uh, yeah. I do think that 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 might have been the case, and perhaps this is um, a viewpoint that people could become at least, you know, understand the value of what it is that they're playing with. Yeah, I think uh, I had um, my friend Giuseppe from Fetus Inversa on a, a few episodes ago, and he, mm -hmm. he said a really good quote where he said, black metal is not just a toy you can hold in your hand. And uh, I think I think it's that kind of a mindset that, uh, yeah, we are playing with fire when playing this kind of music, when mm -hmm. invoking uh, or rather evoking those kind of emotions, not just within yourself, but within the listener you're going to parts of the psyche and the spirit that are unknown realms uh, for us at least as modern society and you're mm -hmm. entering dangerous territories and almost that you're doing it under the guise of music industry and this uh, sort of like you said this this weird thing of like almost like that to me uh, at least personally speaking uh, and i don't know if you'll relate to this but i feel like the whole thing of even selling merch and then selling tickets and then gigs and things like it's almost all like an excuse just to be able to reach within that part of ourselves because financially and logistically speaking it oftentimes doesn't make any sense at all why any of us do this but um, obviously when you make it further up then of course it makes it makes great sense but I don't think that the reason why any of us start doing this is is that thing you know it's to explore that uh, the fire which you mentioned and i think that's what makes the whole thing interesting and that's why you know uh you have a lot of also as a consequence uh you have a lot of also early deaths within uh, involved within this as well you know whether um, self-inflicted or, or not you know this uh, because we go into dangerous places uh so yeah I, I can appreciate what you're trying to say about people being aware of that aspect of it a bit more yes of course yeah, yeah. i mean i would never um i would never uh say that you know both sort of a black metal band at all because we're not um and i sure. really respect um contemporary friends musicians within the black metal scene that actually do play black metal and uh do live that uh, live everything to that level you know i mean it's um those are my friends i i can relate to them uh because of that and not you know because of uh, an ideological content necessarily um uh so yeah that's the fire i was talking about you know um, i think it's 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 a little broader um in all of its relevance but um and i think it could be applied to many different um, areas of music or art and I think uh, many people who express themselves in different forms understand what we've been talking about um, 
yeah, but uh, certainly it's it's uh, a fascinating um, subculture or... Yeah, yeah, I think so. The thing is, you know, uh, one of the interesting, com- uh, I guess, um, examples that I can personally think about, um, which you could uh, relate to the music thing and, and, and what we were talking about, that fire, is, uh, for example, something like football hooliganism. And I know that this is something that like is massively frowned upon. And uh, like I myself, I'm I'm not really big into football, but I think that there's something really interesting happens between groups of people that they're willing to go the distance into violence and into those dangerous places. And all it is is really for football. But I feel like uh, as musicians, it's almost like uh, you've got the key. You know, it's like with the certain combination of notes. Or certain yeah. like drum patterns that you can evoke a similar kind of energy amongst human beings, and I think that's yeah. that's a very powerful thing. You know, it's like you could you could I always say you could change societies just with music. Mm. I uh, know what you what you're saying. Yeah, um, it's, you reach a point of like self abandon like um, uh, yeah, nothing else really matters, and you you dive into the abyss. Um, and yeah, that's that's a, a a very intoxicating thing as well. Um, I think that leads yeah. one to do it, want to do it again and again as well, you know, and uh, see where it takes you. Um, living in an extreme manner and pushing yourself to to places you probably m- might not have gone on a on a uh, you know on a yeah freelance basis in the past, but um, yeah. You end up doing it again and again because uh, I guess it teaches you a lot. You know? Yeah, yeah. I I feel like at least uh, from Are my personal there? experience, uh, <laughs> I'm here, man. I'm here. We're good. Face is frozen again. So yeah. No, no. It's I, I just like dissection too much. No, uh, I think the <laughs> the no, the thing I was uh, trying. No, 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 no. It's all, it's, it's great. Um, uh, yeah, one of the things I was going to say as well was that um, uh, before I, I completely froze up on here, was that uh, at least reflecting on my personal experience of performing live shows, you know, and really trying to go to those places uh, with it, mm-hmm. I think that uh, you're right. It's almost like every time you go on there, it's uh, it's a portal or a doorway to a part of yourself that is uh, that is almost unknown and it's like you can get to know it and it's like there's this thing that you're always getting closer to somehow you know like always like a higher level and um, again it's uh, as I said earlier it's like a form of exercise because you can never reach the ultimate quite but it's like yeah. every time you get one step closer so then you need to come back and reflect. And then you go back and then you push further and then you come back and reflect and then you keep carry on doing this thing. And that's kind of how I look at the live uh, performance thing. I mean, in a, um, I don't know, I guess it, in a way, at least for me personally, I, I also relate playing gigs a lot to uh, sex as well. You know, mm-hmm. it's almost like uh, just having that sort of super high connection with, with someone and then how you could sort of reach further mentally and spiritually mm-hmm. and physically and then you know you kind of just take that uh, one step further every time and that's kind of you know i feel like that's uh, it's all a part of uh, spiritual growth throughout life um you know, and i think so, that's yeah. that's that's why we do it you know like on the paper it makes no fucking sense but i think that's the only reason why it makes sense to do it Oh, of course, yeah, that's a very primitive connection, you know. I mean, that or an undertaking essentially. It's, uh, I mean, we have these faculties, and uh, we're either enticed to use them and uh, exercise them, and in their growth or not. Uh, I think you could, you know, probably take both ways. Uh, some people that might never discover um, something like that. Um, and then there are others which want to <laughs> constantly go a step further. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a very human thing and um, very inhuman at the same time, which is cool. 
yeah yeah in it, it definitely is uh there's an element of uh in inhumane uh sort of uh part of of our existence within there as well you know uh i mean we i said this uh recently to someone i, I don't think we even still fully understand what the fuck we're doing you know we we yeah. dedicate like like you know you know what you're doing in terms of you create the art and then you perform it but what even really is music what is going on there I don't think we still, you know, this many years into the human experience, we fully understand what's going on there. And led to um, to belief that's meant to remain unexplained, you know. And I think um, the music becomes or becomes far more than it is, you know. These these waves of frequencies and uh, which uh, tantalize our emotional state, or um, I think uh, can become far more than that, and. Um, you can't really pinpoint what it actually does to you. And I think that's a good thing, you know. So you sh- this shouldn't be uh, analytical uh, descriptions for everything. <laughs> I think that can uh, sort of, yeah, uh, suffocate the magic within a lot of that. You know, I think that's a thing you should just experience to try to understand. You know, you know that's that's really interesting. I like that mindset because for me, I'm naturally a very curious mind. So I'm always like trying to dig deep into everything and understand things, you know, and not always necessarily even from analytical perspective. But uh, yeah, I, I think for some things, yeah, certainly, you know, like it's it's one of them things. Why do we like first wave of black metal album so much? You know, like how do you explain why you like the first Sarcophago al- album? You know, it's like you, you can't. It's. <laughs> yeah. It's just like if, if if it goes on the the stereo and you start listening to it, it's like fuck yeah. But so like you can't explain why you're reacting to it like that because on the paper it doesn't even probably doesn't even sound that great. You know, I mean to me it does, and probably to yourself, but it's hard to explain why it sounds good. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then it will be, you know, I mean, uh, it's all very relative. I might find you know one album of one band far better than half of my friends would uh, they would choose another album from that band or something and I think that's all very relative but in essence uh, it comes down to where you were at the time you heard it for the first time or what you were feeling and uh, I think that's very decisive in the way you you view things later I think yeah. this is a, yeah that's that's okay. very true. I think uh, I mentioned dissection earlier. I feel like Rain Chaos is is a good example of that. You know, I'm I'm in mm-hmm. the crew of the people who think it's it's a fucking insanely good album, but uh, mm-hmm. you know, and it's and it's profound in my life. But I, I know so many people who who think exactly the opposite as well. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's sure. interesting when that happens. Yeah, yeah it is interesting. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think on a. You, <laughs> What were you sorry, going to say? Man. Sorry, no, no, nothing else. I was just going to say the same for Slayer. I have a, a few Slayer favorites, which are probably the last on the list that people would <laughs> refer to. You know, and, including uh, yeah. which? <laughs> oh, like uh, I don't know, because I I grew up with hearing um, undisputed attitude and uh, and divine intervention first, so they were like my two all time favorites. And then like Seasons in Abyss. But um, a lot of others would obviously be, you know, um, the, the first two or, or three, yeah. So, I mean, Divine Intervention gets a bad name just because of the weird production and just because the band themselves said they didn't like the album. But like to me, <laughs> uh, this might be strange for some people, but uh, actually the first Slayer song I ever heard uh, was uh, Dito Head uh, from, uh, I think it's like track three or four on Divine, which is yeah. like, super fucking fast like in your face crazy fucking song with it like a video where it's like in america there's like a bunch of riots and shit it looks fucking great you know it sounds good too so there's there's yeah. it's it's not all bad you know there is they're weird albums but they have they certainly have great moments i think <laughs> there you go yeah. yes yeah. going with the avant-garde uh, opinions on this podcast uh, <laughs> today <laughs> no but it's great man you know there's there's something listen there's something special in in, in everything i think you know and it's good uh, it's good to sometimes be able to uh, strip releases away from everything that's surrounding them and that and actually be able to just enjoy it for what it is you know or or vice versa you know i think uh, 
uh, some there are definitely going to be albums as well that probably don't sound very good but they just have a lot of hype around them you know mm -hmm. and then everyone just says it's good because they've heard other people say it's good you know what i mean and sure, then sure. it's yeah. like you, you do get these things that, that happen you Me know too. yeah but yeah it's, it's one of them things man uh, so you mentioned uh, about uh growing up and then uh, find out about slayer and things um one thing because uh, i listened to your podcast with uh, alan as well um i mean of course uh, like as soon as that came out i was like great because uh, i literally sent you an email asking you if you wanted to be on ableist manifestations and then yeah. i feel like a day later that podcast dropped i was like ha <laughs> there's there's uh, this there seems to uh, he seems to have beat me to it but uh, one thing that you mentioned on that uh, conversation which uh, kind of stood out to me and uh, i was hoping to get into a bit more if you don't mind was mm -hmm. uh, just the thing of uh, i mean it goes in line with everything else we've just said but you said that uh, in uh, during childhood and growing up you were always a bit of an uh, outsider even back then and mm -hmm. uh you know and that's obviously something i personally like totally relate to and i'm just wondering if you can maybe uh delve into that a bit more and just dig a bit Elaborate. deeper as to like uh, what it was actually like growing up yeah sure um i know it was it was uh it's always different having a different name or always looked a little bit different as well um acted a little bit different i think um and that was interesting during primary school times although you always have your friends i mean they were good people who uh stuck up for you and you know that you that you liked a lot um but i guess what i meant to say was i was never obviously the popular kid uh, unless you were in your own little circle of friends and um yeah you know, i just got faced with a lot of uh, prejudice as well um culturally uh whatnot and you know down to having long hair uh or uh, a ginger beard you know shit like that you know how kids are mm. and uh so yeah it was it was always uh some kind of uh unacceptance there and being the black sheep but i guess you, you, by that time i was you know 17 18 and already uh getting into things which I mean, were for me that just went hand in hand. It wasn't as if I was wanting to be accepted. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the whole mental factor really uh, gave you a, an additional home or family uh, ideology to be a part of, and, and uh, yeah, that ended up meaning a lot to me. But yeah, just um, discovering rock and roll and the the more melancholic, darker sides of of music from very early on. Um, uh, that's I guess that made you feel at home, like you know, with those with those certain little gems in your life, and uh, gave you some gave you some solace and yeah, in an otherwise perhaps less accepting uh, uh, context. So yeah, that was always you know, I mean, an outsider uh, definitely in certain certain terms, and I still am, and I like that. It's um, I find it very hard to get along with a lot of people, but very easy to get along with others. And um, it's I don't think that will ever change. You know, um, yeah, it's not it's not something that it's it's not as if I'm saying oh, woe is me. Um, I am you know, <laughs> I am not accepted. That's <laughs> exactly the opposite. I feel quite comfortable. Um, yeah, not being part of a wider bigger thing you know that's i'm i'm good with that i'm cool with that yeah well that strikes me as a very high degree of uh, self-awareness and consequently uh self-acceptance which i don't think a lot of people really have that today I mean, right so would you almost even see that the whole outsider thing as some kind of uh, uh blessing uh whilst it might have been challenging at the time yeah, for sure, absolutely. But I'm sure there are, I mean, many people within um, my circle of friends, or you know, be they musicians or not, would would say the same thing to you. Um, uh, but I, I don't think I really know it any differently. You know, um, I mean, you do get um, 
uh, element of adoration and reverence from uh, as a musician from certain fans and things like that but um it's uh yeah um or from your friends within certain circles uh yeah it's 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 <laughs> it's a place i like to be uh, you know being not the center of attention otherwise i mean i don't stand on i don't play music live to be the center of attention i stand there because i ended up doing that and want to i want to get this thing out and i want to go somewhere else and uh the the live music playing it performing it allows me to do that um and also um you know with the hope that certain other people can experience that perhaps um so it might be an egotistical undertaking as well as a very selfless one um but i think that contradiction in itself is also uh acceptable yeah so you're mostly just acting as the vessel to channel the thing which is the right. which is the art yeah. and the music to come through and be, get, right. basically get projected into the masses exactly yeah yeah i think that uh, i mean you said that if i were to this might be an exaggeration <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, you said earlier that uh, if I were to ask uh, your uh, circle of friends, then most people would say the same. But it's also that that's still not a lot of people, if you think about it. I mean, even if you think yeah. about how many people are on the planet and how many people listen to uh, heavy metal, it's not many people. Yes, it might be popular in, in the grand scheme of things, right. but we're all still sure. fucking outsiders. And there's a very small group of us that end up going through this kind of thing. I mean... For me yeah, personally, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. For me personally, just to interject as well, uh, one of the things that has been very clear to me throughout uh, the majority of my adulthood, I would say, and more so in the recent years, is that uh, this music is is what found me rather than the other way around. And mm -hmm. the whole, I think, point of it, whether if you want to get into like the karmic influence and things like that. I feel like the purpose behind it, uh, the universal reason behind it, was to basically uh, put me through a series of tests uh, to basically uh, find myself and find my own purpose and uh, basically get forged into the person that I am today. And uh, I mean, it's, it's funny when you think that this is all just like a bunch of riffs and, and then a bunch of noise that we make, but it's so much deeper. It's your whole life uh, that, oh. that gets built because of just an adoration of uh, of this uh, noise that we all like to share basically i think that's a, that's a pretty nice analogy of yeah absolutely <laughs> i could i could agree with that sure yeah yeah and i think that uh, that's the again the very special thing about it as well you know like uh, if you're like to me at least you know sometimes it's good not to get too personal about these things but um if you're like selling merch or if you're like selling vinyls that might seem like a little impersonal when you're just looking at numbers but really this is all people who uh, or at least most of them there will be the ones who share that similar kind of interest and have found perhaps like a piece of their own uh, the thing that they're now then trying to take in and consume you know, so it's like even then mm -hmm. that in itself is a form of connection, you know, and I feel like just because we're surrounded by uh, musician friends and stuff, it might be good to uh, still recognize that we're still in, in, a, in a vast minority here, you know, and that the, there's obviously a lot of, it, I think, importance uh, to that very small, tiny community that we might have. Sure. That's definitely putting things into... Uh into context there yeah um i think one can forget that rather quickly you know i mean uh even uh playing in front of a reasonable amount of people every evening um it's still not a lot of people and um yeah it's uh that's nice to to know that a lot of consumers or people present um and um, musical contemporaries and colleagues um coming from a, the same situation or similar situation it's uh reassuring and uh gives one a sense of purpose as well you know um, um 
although we're really walking our own paths a lot and quite often but it's it's nice to be a, a part of something that you can feel comfortable being a part of you know um, uh, i think another factor uh, i'd like to mention there and and that uh is uh, I never liked being uh, a part of a identity, you know, like a wider identity that was uh, quite sustainable for me, sort of in uh, in uh, yeah, in a theoretical context, and I that remains to this day. Um, so I, I think that also forged um, a certain element of of what we do with the band musically as well. I always wanted to have things a little bit differently you know well i think uh this is one of them things obviously you absolutely stand out in the way that you do things you know everything from just appearance to if just even the sound of the music like i said earlier there's not many bands that really sound like bolzer you know or uh if they do it, it might be intentional because they came after okay. You know, and I think that um, that's that's a part of what makes this special as well. I mean, just speaking of just the tour package that you're currently on, every band sounds completely different, you know, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I would presume that there's that mutual respect between everyone because you're all doing your own things. It's a, you know, I think this is a, it's a, might be a bit of a silly example, but it's kind of like in a relationship where um, they always say that you can't love someone else if you don't love yourself. And I feel like mm -hmm. it's that kind of a thing where it's like you have to walk your own path. But then through that, those of us who do this then build this mutual respect and uh, admiration of uh, each other's work and share that sort of bond because we've all been through the thing, perhaps through different paths, through different mm -hmm. uh, methods, vessels, and mm -hmm. uh, different approaches, but that you all still have that thing in common. And I think that's what makes this uh, music a yeah. uh, very special thing uh, communally. Communally, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, we are tribal beings and um, it is uh, nice to be a part of something, you know, <laughs> um, for sure, I guess. It's, um, just depends on which volume and how you feel you're presented as an individual within that within that format and yeah no, definitely absolutely man and uh, you mentioned that you said you're playing obviously to pretty like relatively large venues um on the on the tour uh, how have you been finding these shows uh, what's it like and what's it like having to fill all of that space as a two-piece band every night that's a nice challenge for sure. Uh, these venues have been have been great. Um, quite a few we haven't been to, which is good. Um, and as I mentioned, the turnouts have been uh, far from disappointing. Um, and yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it is a challenge. It's uh, as a two piece for sure. But it's something you I like to take take on board and. Uh, try to nail um, take the reins yeah yeah for sure i'll take the reins um we've done that before you know we've been faced it's not the first time we've been faced with that trying to fill a larger stage but i i do rather enjoy it um uh, because it's hard and um it, it allows i mean the, the 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 possibilities of having this uh emotional spiritual exchange with the audience and the room itself um the potential to have a uh a more meaningful or, or more powerful experience is is increased with certain venues not necessarily based on their size but um just how it feels like as a as a construct and as a yeah as a um but it's essentially it is part of the vessel as well you know it's like or the channeling um yeah it's so, like your church yeah it's like your church right yeah thank you <laughs> i guess that was the word i was looking for the temple um the place of worship and yeah um most certainly it's that's what's going on um yeah so large or small i mean I, I do really i do really enjoy playing uh small intimate clubs um and 
I do enjoy very large ones sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's always about. Uh, I think one of the things that you said as well about how the venue feels. Um, one thing that I personally feel is how the venue, um, regardless of its scale, is able to sustain that sort of. I don't know what's the right word for it. I don't think there is a word for it, but it's that sort of ignition between the the artist and the audience, and the, how we all get the, the, get grasped by the sound and the and the feeling and the vibe together. Mm, absolutely, ignition. That's a nice nice term to be using. Uh, I always found there was a a very sort of cyclic cyclical exchange going on this um host ignition you know you have to ignite you have to find the the common spark and then once it's going like it's uh uninterrupted the exchange of energy between uh, between the when for me the the magic within the performance happens um if that's not there then I find it's a very one-sided undertaking and it lacks a lot of um, the explosive qualities that I enjoy of, of life music or about life music. Yeah, so... I feel that completely. Yeah. I've been on I've been on that that side of the deal. I've been on both sides of that, mm -hmm. uh, so I can relate to exactly what you're saying. I think it's like a... It's a it's a very um weird uh I know I'm making like a lot of like sex examples and references here but it's like almost like a like a bit of an intercourse uh, <laughs> with with the audience yeah, yeah. where it feels like yeah. you give them something and then they give you something back and then you give them more mm -hmm. then they give you more and then like together this whole thing just keeps growing and growing and becoming more powerful and um uh, yeah it's mm -hmm. that's i think that's kind of what what makes it special is if you can capture something like that uh, i mean mm -hmm. i've i've always heard i've never uh been to south america before but i've always heard like south american audiences are notorious for those kind of experiences uh, would you say that's that's kind of true um yeah i mean we've, we've had uh, some <laughs> really maniacal uh, um contact with the south south, south american crowds yeah um sure. Maniacal, I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm very, um, yeah, they're very passionate and emotional about that, and I love that. And uh, but at the same time, I mean, a lot of the venues were there was uh, perhaps some of the some of the quality in terms of technicality there and and equipment and um, and uh, yeah, sort of audio systems were lacking, so they're. I mean, mm. we weren't touring on a very large level. It was it was small, smaller clubs, and there were a lot of issues with um, with the equipment present. So that made some of the shows hard to you know translate in this in the terms we were just referring to. So, um, but then uh, some of the other shows were fantastic, and it was just uh, yeah, combined with you know the touring. Uh, uh, the, the way you tour South America is usually flying and long flights and uh, the, the lack of sleep and it just made everything rather rather dreamlike you know like uh, <laughs> um, or nightmarish or <laughs> it's just you were you were on a you were on a different plane anyway and then uh, being faced with these uh, crowds at two or three in the morning um, it was a special thing yeah for sure I'd, I I need to do that again I uh, we're working on that. On south america again so look forward to it yeah that sounds good man yeah that that mm -hmm. would be uh that would be great uh you know ac actually this has just made me think as well what are some of the like the health protocols that you might take on tour with you are there anything you do like because i know diet and things like that are so fucking hard to keep up uh you know and i don't mean like necessarily mm -hmm. going on tour and then choosing to diet as you go on but you still want to have uh, somewhat of like you want to have habits to actually keep you alive whilst you're trying to play these <laughs> shows, you know, or maybe not. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, thinking, no, no. Uh, if, uh, if there's any like particular routines and stuff uh, you you personally like to partake in uh, that help. Touring can be a most unhealthy thing, absolutely, um, and uh, 
I'm definitely not abstinent. I like to keep certain routines active. I, I usually do a lot more sport at home than I would on the tour. Um, but it does sometimes come down to, you know, the schedules, time schedules, and when you're arriving at venues, what you have to do first. Um, I could definitely be a little more disciplined regarding uh, exercise and sport. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll be catching up on some more activity these coming days. And, yeah, I mean, diet-wise, um, often a little bit more difficult for me. I'm a vegan as well. So it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, you, you, I can't just eat anything. But I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm quite flexible there as well. I usually find my own solutions. So go out, find a shop, or I bring some certain rations with me. Um, I usually stock up on, on certain things that I can have as backup when everything else is lacking. So, yeah, that's cool. I like to live both, you know. I like to live healthily and unhealthily sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, yeah, especially on touring. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you, you can't, uh, well, you can, but I choose not to, you know, be completely abstinent of alcohol or anything. It's mm -hmm. uh, Sure. Yeah, yeah, well, of course. I mean, the healthiest thing, like one of the most important factors for your health is arguably your sleep and that's uh that that fucking thing oh, yeah, is like yeah. gone there's like no way around it <laughs> no but i mean uh sleep sleep i i, I it's really important for me um uh you might you know might be deficient sometimes and you just make up for it catch up um but i need my sleep in order that my voice uh remains manageable if i don't then uh things can go south really quickly you know and i think you learned that as a singer i mean I, I guess some singers are immune or they seem to be but uh yeah good on them <laughs> but i definitely need to get my sleep and i like sleeping so yeah yeah well it's everything it's your mood you know all your hormones you know like if you oh, have like uh, yeah. one or two nights of bad sleep like the whole thing just goes out for like a like a week you know and it's like yeah. You know, um, uh, I think this is why, uh, like, you always read the stories of, like, uh, Lemmy when he was touring with Hawkwind, you know, how they were all on psychedelics and he was on amphetamines all night. So he wouldn't sleep. So he would come in and he was in a pissy mood at everyone. <laughs> it's just kind of like, you know, um, I know it's like, yeah, kind right. of like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. I know I'm maybe killing the roman romanticization of the, of the whole thing a little bit by bringing that sort of like the, the at least the scientific understanding into it but it's kind of like i think it's good to look at things like that too right you know rather than just like oh it's all rock and roll just go on go all. on tour that's, just that's, to that's, yeah that's, yeah right uh okay uh i think uh whilst you guys are making your way through the uh treacherous uh roads of spain uh i'm gonna <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm gonna leave you be uh and uh and uh let you uh catch some rest but man thank you so much for uh jumping on the podcast i do really really appreciate it um oh and absolutely sean and thank you for inviting me and um i look forward to i'll see you in london i guess then. that's right yeah i'll see you in in london man you know we'll, we'll be right there and uh we're also doing the show together uh uh we're playing, uh, I think, Fortress Festival uh, in the yeah. UK next June. That's yeah. right. That's going to yeah, be cool. So, yeah, man, we'll, we'll be fucking great to share the stage with you guys. So I'm really excited for that. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see you guys in London. Uh, is there anything uh, you'd like to share with people at all before we head off? Um, yeah, come out and uh, see the package. It's uh, definitely worth it. And uh, yeah, look forward to seeing anyone present out there and uh, thank you for listening and thank you shine once again for for having me awesome brother awesome thank you so much for jumping on and cool, uh to all of the listeners of iblis manifestations as well as always thank you guys for listening to the podcast we'll see you on the next one